Yeah, we're here to learn about the Montana Forest Action Plan. We're very pleased to have Matt Arno here uh, with Montana DNRC, the Forestry Assistance Bureau Chief. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> yeah, I'm, unfortunately, it's getting to be a few decades. Uh, so I'm going to do my best here to talk about our Forest Action Plan. I was definitely a part of this process. This is my first time giving a presentation about it. So I will ask Eric or Jason Todd Hunter if, he ha if you have any thoughts, if you think I missed something, please speak up. And I'll take questions during this process. So please go ahead and ask questions if you have them. So what is a forest action plan? Uh, in 2000, the 2008 Farm Bill, Congress said, hey, we give states all this funding through state and private forestry arm of the Forest Service. We want to know more about what you're doing with this money and we want you to be deliberate about what you're doing with it. And so um, you can see on the slide, we're supposed to assess the conditions of the forest develop strategies to conserve working forests, protect forests from harm, and enhance public benefits, and offer practical and a comprehensive roadmap for investing those funds that they give us. So in a lot of cases, those forest action plans were done to check a box. Congress said do this, the Forest Service said do this because we're giving you this money, and in this case, in 2020, we said that we were going to do a more robust process. And so you can, you can see the outline here is pretty similar to the first slide. But what I want to point out is that we had a 23-member collaborative group. We called it... MFAC, the Montana Forest Action Advisory Council, and it was made up of industry partners, conservation organizations, most of the agencies that operate in forestry within the state, collaborative groups, watershed groups, recreation and tourism entities, and so it was a pretty robust process. And Jason Todd Hunter was on it. Anybody else that I'm missing? that's in the room. Tim Love, I know he's here today. He, he's a member. So we started out with the assessment of forest conditions and we did that in both a written narrative and by looking at a lot of data. Um, if you, I'm going to show you where the Forest Action Plan site is. You can go and look at, take a look at the assessment if you like. And then we also spent a lot of time with the data trying to figure out where we should be paying attention to things, where we should be prioritizing our work, and that turned into the priority areas for focused attention. And then we have a lot of goals and strategies to try to address the issues that we identified in the assessment of forest conditions. And there's no, there's no real big surprises there. I think most of us in this room know what some of the issues are that our forests face, but we did dig into all of them. And this is just a timeline of uh, the process that we took, started with the assessment, and then started using the data to come up with the priority areas, and then came up with the implementation goals and strategies. At the same time, we were creating the Montana Wildfire Risk Assessment, which is probably one of the most robust, if not the ro most robust, uh, wildfire risk assessment in the country right now. It uses some of the very newest data and some of the very um, best computing power to create this. Um, Pyrologics in Missoula did that work for us. And we also spend a lot of time identifying um, the 
the values at risk within the state. But the one of the things that's important about getting good data, and I'll get to this here in just a minute, but there's a lot of acres that need attention. And the one good thing about the data is I think it's helping us focus in the right places. It's not everything we should be paying attention to, but it does help us get there. Um, so here's just a snapshot of uh, some of the data from the Montana wildfire risk assessment and the darker areas are the higher risk. Probably no real big surprise there. Um, but you look at Ravalli County and it was interesting to see Mark's slide uh, where he was looking at the Ravalli County, Missoula County area. You could see all the fires, the historic fires in Ravalli County. So this is where the Montana Forest Action Plan lives on the web. Um, it's a, this is actually a pretty good website. At the state, a lot of our websites aren't very good um, and the governor is helping us with that and has tasked us with improving it. Uh, but this actually is a pretty good website. It's on the RCUB platform and uh, if you go take a look at it, I think you'll see that uh, it has some really, it operates pretty well and it has some good information. You can toggle a lot of the layers on and off and, and learn some things. And if you Google Montana Forest Action Plan, it'll come right up. So I was alluding to, um, we got a lot of acres at risk. So this was the first stab at uh, trying to narrow the 23 million acres down and this is a compilation of some forest health layers, the national insects and disease risk, the insects and disease impact and the western spruce budworm reoccurrence and then some wildfire data layers which is, uh, include the wildfire hazard potential, recent fire history, and distance to the wildland urban interface. And you come up with about nine million acres at risk, which is too much to really focus on, right? So um, we took a look at a couple more data layers, uh, proximity to roads and vegetation type, and narrowed that down but it's still almost four, four million acres. And the, the data sets that we ended up using here um, are the best ones that we had that cover the whole state. There are places where there is better data, but it, it didn't cover the whole state. So we ended up having to um, use these layers, but they're, they're still good data. And I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna talk just a little bit more about the prioritization here in just a minute, but before I do that, I wanna just show you some of the things that are on the uh, website. If you wanted to go look, you can click on a tab for a county. This is Lewis and Clark County, and you can see that there's almost 350,000 priority acres, uh, almost, 52,000 of those are in the wildland urban interface. And then if you want to click on a particular polygon, you can see, and, and the one that is clicked on here is this one with the um, blue outline. So you can see more data about that. about that polygon. And then that's what that polygon looks like without the, uh, without the information pulled up. So you can see that they are kind of oddly shaped. And I think we all recognize that when it comes to going and doing treatment, you know, we're gonna be not just following those um, 
those polygons, but it gives you a good place to start. And so, is this the definitive answer on the priorities or the only places that, are these the only places that we're going to work? No, but it gives us a good place to start. And the way we want to improve on this is by getting data from local, from local organizations, from local people. We, we need the fire safe groups or the collaborative groups or the counties to tell us where we should really be focusing. Not just on those polygons, but maybe there's part of an area that we completely missed or maybe we should be paying attention to more than just in those polygons. And that is happening quite a bit in some places. I'd say Lincoln County is one of the places that it's happening um, the most frequently and that there are the most robust set of partners working on this kind of issue. And so we are looking for local knowledge to help us determine where we should be working. And I would add, just knowing how many subdivisions are near wildland or urban interface layer is changing all the time. It is. <clears throat> and we have a lot of new people showing up, but we're looking for the county commissioners, the fire safe groups, the collaboratives, um, others with local knowledge to help us determine where we should be working. So how is this going to push the Forest Service into doing more? I mean, you can lever all the leverage you want, and if we don't have the want the leadership within the Forest Service to do anything, we're not going to do I agree with you, um, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about that at the end. I, I want to, I'm going to have a slide just a little later here talking about um, how we're pushing things moving forward, and I think that'll partially get to that, and then if, if you don't think it does, bring it back up. Um, so I just wanted to show one of the uh, pages here, or a couple of the pages uh, that where we dig into the wildfire risk in the plan. And this is the description of wildfire risk. And then there's recommendations for goals and strategies. And you can see that it's fairly extensive. One of the things that Excuse me, I just need to get to the next slide here. We, we really want to work with communities to um, deal with the risk at the community. So um, addressing the home ignition zone and neighborhood scale issues is the, uh, one of the bullets there. And you know, that's one of the main things that I think we need to pay a lot of attention to um, is how communities are burning or not and what we can do to keep that from happening. Okay, so we had the Montana Forest Action Advisory Council that helped develop the forest action plan and the state forester and the governor thought it would be a good idea to keep some of that oversight and so uh, they turned they turned into the Montana Forest Action Council I know it says committee up there but it's actually council um, and that's a subset of some of the members that were on the Montana Forest Action Advisory Committee. And they are helping make sure that we use this plan to move forward and, and actually do things on the ground and that all of the agencies do things on the ground. And if, oops, if you look at the membership here, um, the Forest Service 
has been very involved all along with this process. And one of the reasons for that is we want to have commitment from all of the agencies within the state and everybody who has a, or at least most of the groups that have a stake in how our forests are managed, to be paying attention to what we're doing and seeing if we're really using this plan to follow through or if we're just going to put it up on the shelf. And I can assure you we are doing our best not to put it up on the shelf. And one of the ways we're doing that is by having uh, MFAC watch over what we're doing. They meet almost monthly. I know many of them talk to the governor and keep him apprised of what we're doing. And I'm pretty sure he's telling them what, what he would like to see. And I know he's telling us what he would like to see. So that's one of the ways that we're all pushing to get more work done on the ground using this forest action plan. And some of the members have changed. Um, many of them only had a one year term to begin with, but they, they're all um, getting replaced with a like member. Um, Carol Brooker is a commissioner in Sanders County. Uh, we have another commissioner who's going to replace her, Blake Henning from Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, His, he's termed out. I know we're getting another member. And I know the governor is looking at that membership uh, right now. So, missing the IA and tribes? Actually, uh, well, thank you. Durglow, yeah, Jim Durglow is the, he's a member of the Intertribal Timber Council. Yeah. Um, I think know. most of you know Gordy Sanders. Um, and Tim Love. Jeff Schmidt represents uh, Red Lodge Mountain and the recreation industry. Holly McKenzie now works for DNRC, but she was representing private landowners, so she, her seat will be, um, will get a new member. Uh, Ethan Kennard, he's the Montana Watershed Coordination Council Executive Director, and Mark Agnes is TNC. So, your point, Bev, is that you think we need to have more engagement? Yeah, we don't have them listed, uh, or are because BIA is an agency. Yeah, not you're right, we, we don't. I guess we've relied on Jim to help us with that tie. Okay, so let's talk about how we are using the plan to get work done on the ground. And the first example here is uh, the funding that we got from the state's fire suppression account. When there is more than $40 million in that account, then the governor can allocate some of that to doing work on the ground. And so we got some of that funding and we went out with an RFP and this is, shows some of the examples of the uh, projects that we funded. We got 14, almost $14 million in total requests, 47 applications, proposed treatment, 71,000 acres, and the matching added uh, $3 million. And we put about $4 million out on the ground through this funding. So almost, almost doubled the amount of uh, funding with the match. Ended up funding 14 projects to treat around 12,000 acres. So this is uh, the RFP that we recently put out from the Forestry Assistance Bureau. And um, we have a number of different funding sources that we get through state and private forestry and a little bit from state funds. And you can see the grant programs there. I think some of you are aware of these grant programs. We've had them for quite a long time and we've been doing this kind of work for quite a long time but this is also this is how we're going to uh, implement the forest action plan is through these various 
different kinds of funding. Uh, the community wildfire defense grants, that's gonna be a new source of funding that comes from the infrastructure bill. And it's probably gonna be two times the amount of funding that we've had through our other uh, wildfire grant funds in the past. Am I getting that right, Eric? At least, yeah. yeah. So many of you probably have, or some of you have participated in our uh, WUI grants, and this is going to be similar, but we think it's gonna be even a bigger pot of funding. So something that we did a little different this year is we tried to put all of our grants together in this one RFP to try to make it a little easier for uh, our partners, for contractors, and others that would be interested so that instead of having these grants come out various times over the year and having to try to communicate that to people, which I don't think we did a particularly good job, we're trying to lump them all together and come out with an RFP once or twice a year. And I actually hope that next time we do this, we'll be able to have those uh, funds from the fire suppression account as well. So we continue to make this easier for people to understand what the opportunities are. Here's some of the grant partners that we have uh, that we work with in forestry assistance. And I guess the important piece of this is, is it's going to take a ton of partners to get this work done on the ground. At DNRC, we really don't do any of that work on the ground. We're always working with contractors, um, local government, NGOs uh, to help us get that work done out on the ground. So if you're interested in this, uh, you can go to our website and uh, take a look at it. The Forest Stewardship page actually is in pretty good shape. That's been updated. And uh, hopefully when we get a new platform, it will be uh, even easier to use. You can see that this is just, uh, this is not all the projects that we're working on. This is a representation of some of them, but you can see that they're scattered all around the state, and some of them cover the whole state, like the statewide urban reforestation project, and uh, just give you a sense of where we're, where we're working. It is across the whole state. And a few examples of that, this is uh, in the southeast part of the state, near the Chalk Buttes. And uh, w I think one of the reasons that this is an important project is actually in the eastern part of the state, they've had a lot of fire that's pretty much completely removed a lot of that forest. So um, hopefully by doing some of this work ahead of time, the next time it burns, some of this forest will actually persist. This is the uh, Pines project out near um, Fort Peck Lake, and it includes uh, work around communities, and it also includes some prescribed fire outside the communities. And this is a project where DNRC, BLM, and other partners are working together with those landowners to get this work done. This is the Red Lodge Mountain Project. Um, it's pretty interesting to talk to Jeff Schmidt about why this is important for them. You know, the community of Red Lodge relies pretty heavily on uh, the ski area. It's over 300 jobs in that relatively small community. And the mountain is pretty close to the community, so I think this actually uh, is going to have some positive effects for the community from a wildfire standpoint. But the most important thing when you talk to Jeff about this is he said if they completely lose their forest, they think they'll probably, the ski area probably won't uh, survive because they need some tree cover to help hold that snow. And uh, he has an example of a ski area 
in Colorado last year where the ski area burned and they're no longer holding snow in that ski area. So he, he thinks that the forest from that standpoint is extremely important to them. And so that's another benefit to this project is just to help that ski area survive and uh, keep that economic driver in uh, Carbon County. So the Sorrel Springs GNA project is a pretty important one because it's the first time that uh, DNRC is contracting outside NEPA, is what we call it, but that's a contractor to go do the NEPA for the Forest Service. One of the reasons the Forest Service has a hard time getting projects out the door is NEPA can take years, right? And there's only so many NEPA teams in the state. And so by doing uh, some contract NEPA, then the state can help get more work done because the Forest Service doesn't have to do that NEPA. So that's one of the ways that we're helping get more work done on federal land. And the Good Neighbor Authority Program in general uh, is helping get more work done on federal land. We have about eight foresters right now working uh, with the Forest Service on various different projects and getting some contract NEPA done I think is another important piece to that. Now I think you've got to put that in perspective. It's not like we're probably going to be able to hire contractors to do big complex NEPA, but this is a fairly small project. It's like 140 acres, but it has subdivisions all the way around it and so it's pretty important for that local community and we can take a little bit of that workload off uh, by doing contract NEPA. Any any comments about that? Yeah, Jason. Oh, yeah. So I'll do my best. Maybe somebody might have to help me with this. Um, when the Forest Service or a federal agency has to do a, or is going to do a project, they have to follow the National Environmental Policy Act, which means that there has to be pretty extensive environmental analysis done before the project can happen. How did I do? Okay. How long does that take you? It depends, but it's usually a year to two or three years, maybe longer. So it takes a long time. Matt? Yeah. Yeah. On those areas where the movie or where the private property or housing was compromised. So a lot of the acres that were identified by MFAC also are on that same. On those uh, same landscapes, same yeah. Um, has anyone explored looking at that more? I mean, the Forest Service has used it a few times. And it went all the way to the Ninth Circuit on Smith Shields and Moose Creek, and we won. And then it's like they quit using it. You know, and, and a big problem with the Forest Service we hear is that they have such a backlog for NEPA, and it's one of the areas they struggle. They, they're lacking ecologists to get those projects done. And in those areas where it's, where it's a, a high priority to get it done, it just makes sense to me that we can look at that as an option. I agree. I think that we probably should be using those categorical exclusions more. And I think that the contract NEPA might be one of those places that we can do that uh, because those are usually need to be smaller, simpler type projects. And um, I, I agree with you, Jason. And I think that's something that we need to push for. Three thousand, I think. Excuse me, three thousand yep. acres. So, uh, in the right spot, that's a good tool. Yep. Uh, but there are so many acres of treatment that you can't you can't stack up. Any reason to use CE 
after C, after right. C in another area because that will get challenged. So, so the forester has to be very careful about where they choose to use C. Absolutely. So yeah, Beth. Is this covered in the price cap base analysis? No, I, I don't think it was. It's but actually. The good news is, you know, based on Mark's um, presentation this morning, a bunch of the area surrounding Sorrel Springs has been prescribed burn. Yep. And it's been harvested um, as well as burn. And so, uh, to me, the in your prioritization, I didn't see if you had incorporated previously treated areas as part of the prioritization, but this is just like right adjacent. Yes, and we are, we are trying to look at that and we are trying to improve our data so we can be a little better than that, but that is where the local knowledge comes in. And I do think, as you said, Bev, the Frenchtown face was a pretty big project, did a lot of treatment in this area, but this was a spot that didn't get treated, and so I do think that's where a CE and some of these smaller NEPA projects can help fill in the hole. Yeah, Pat? Hey, Matt. Uh, good neighbor also had cross boundary. Cross boundary with, with the project. I do. Um, let me get through just a couple more of these and then we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, so the governor has tasked us with tracking what we're doing. Uh, last year, and this is just for uh, DNRC. Last year he wanted us to get 25,000 acres treated. This year it's 31,000 acres. And you can see that we haven't made as much progress as we would like, but I had to turn these slides in pretty early. So we've actually, we just, we update this every month for the governor and we have added a little more than a thousand more acres. And for forestry assistance, we're up to 771. And if I could get my phone to work here. We have a little bit more in the other, all the other categories. Um, part of, the, part of the, th the deal with us tracking our acres is we really only, he wants a report on it every month, but we generally do that quarterly and we generally start working on things at the beginning of the year and then it ramps up toward the end of the year. I guess my point with this is though that MFAC uh, Montana Forest Action Council and the governor are both tasking us with tracking what we're doing. And we're talking with our federal partners about that as well. You know, we've only been in this state, we've only been treating all together, all agencies, about 100 to 120,000 acres a year. And even if we get up to 200,000 acres a year, if we're going to get close to that 3.89 million acres that are identified for the highest priority treatment that would still take us 20 years so i think it gives you it gives you a sense of the scope of the problem and what we really need to do um, or we really need to ramp up our efforts to really try to tackle that so what kind of budget are you receiving to achieve that objective so we have been getting the funds from the fire suppression account, which is all relatively new. That's only in the last few years. We are getting quite a few more funds through infrastructure. So is the Forest Service. And to get to Pat's point, I, I'll talk just a little bit about what we're doing for cross-boundary work to try to become more efficient too. I just, let me get through this last uh, couple slides. This is a slide of what the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, the NRCS, which is uh, kind of a partner, or they are a partner federal agency, but they're almost a sister agency to us in forestry assistance because they work with private landowners. They're a federal agency that works with private landowners, and this shows you how much they've increased the dollars that they're putting into forest management in this state since 2015. And actually, I think if we updated this to uh, 2022, I bet it's close to $11 million, probably. 
Um, we successfully got four Joint Chiefs projects recently, and that's so that's another source of funding that comes through the NRCS. So they've more than quadrupled the amount of dollars and therefore the amount of acres that are getting treated uh, on private land with the NRCS. Anything to add, Celie? No, it's my slide. It's good. Yeah, <laughs> it is your slide. <laughs> Okay, so what's next? Um, we are working really hard to work across boundaries and across agencies and with everybody who's willing. And one of the benefits to that is I think we can be significantly more efficient and get acres treated on both sides of the fence at the same time instead of having two different contractors coming in at two different times. So we can be more efficient, we can get more acres done in a faster period of time, it can be less expensive, and we have all these new sources of funding. Uh, we have the infrastructure bill, I already mentioned the Community Wildfire Defense Grant, which just to the state is probably going to double or maybe triple the amount of dollars that we can grant out for work on state and private land. The NRCS has already quadrupled the amount of work they're doing on private land. Uh, the infrastructure bill, I don't know how much more the Forest Service is getting and the BLM, but it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of extra funding. And we are, you, you missed it, or no, I think it's this afternoon. If you want to learn more about what we're doing with prescribed fire, you can uh, hear Julia Berkey from DNRC talk about that. Um, we are going to have another um, chunk of funding that comes from the fire suppression account. That's that RFP 2.0. And we think that we might, we'll see, we might get a little help from the uh, legislature. In the last legislative session, we actually got some help helping us be a little more efficient. We were having to do MEPA. That's uh, the Montana, the state version of NEPA. We were having to do that on private land. And uh, through uh, the MLA, they, they started asking the question, why are, you, why are you doing that? Doesn't seem like it's um, very useful because we don't have control over that private land. It was pretty much just an exercise that we had to do. And so um, the MLA worked with some legislators and helped us get rid of that requirement. So that's saving us time to help get more work done on private land. So there's quite a few things that we're working on. The last thing is to really increase the amount of cross-boundary work we're doing. We've been talking, uh, our state forester has been talking with uh, um, the, her counterparts in the federal agencies and some of the other agencies about creating a cross-boundary coordinating group. And the idea there would be that we have these local groups that are doing things like in Lincoln County, Flathead County, or Valley County, and they are helping us determine where we should be putting dollars on the ground talking to private landowners, getting them grouped up, and creating a lot of efficiencies that way. But it's not happening across the whole state. And so if we were to have a cross-boundary coordinating group to really bring all that together and try to uh, ramp it up across the whole state, that we think we can gain some more efficiencies that way. So I think that you'll see in the next year or so that we're going to be standing up this cross-boundary coordinating group so that we can be more efficient uh, and effective across the whole state. Yeah, Tim? Yeah, will that be at the county level? We think that it should start basically at the county level, yes. And feed up into these uh, zone coordinators who can help those groups identify funding sources that might fit for them and help all of us determine what the opportunities are in their area. And, in a, and we have these few places where it's probably working 
pretty well already, but there's a lot of places where it's not. And so those coordinators can help those places get organized and, and ramped up. Yeah. Uh, I'm, from, I'm from Libby, uh, Lincoln County, and as you mentioned, there's a, there's a lot of coordination going on between uh, DNRC, the county, and the company to, uh, to, to implement the action plan, uh, looking at the fire risk assessment, using uh, GNA, looking at uh, shared stewardship uh, approaches, uh, and some very good on the ground successes working together, but they're the small projects. Right. Uh, and because Lincoln County is primarily forest service, uh, the, the bulk of the areas that need treatment are federal lands. And, and, and working together again, these groups are identifying the highest priority. The, the, the Kootenai National Forest is, is going to continue using uh, environmental assessments to look at work needed at a landscape level. And, and the, the challenge on the Kootenai is that they'll do fine work, the, the decision will get appealed, and then those will get upheld, then they get litigated. And, right. and I think the, the groups that might be the least knowledgeable about the action plan, the fire risk, uh, and, and what is at risk are judges. So I don't know if, if the committee or the governor can get an audience with the judges and and share the information that you've all gathered and why it's important. So one of the things that we're doing um, in DNRC to help work on that is uh, my previous position, uh, or this is a position that I previously held in DNRC is local government forest advisor. Steve Kimball is now our local government forest advisor. We work with counties and collaboratives who want to support projects that get litigated and we help them get the resources to do an amicus brief or in a few cases uh, in Lincoln County in particular the uh, AFRC American Forest Resource Council has helped the county intervene in those lawsuits and to so to try to help educate uh, that's probably the wrong word but try to help uh, explain the benefits of those projects better. Um, so that's one thing that's happening there. The other thing that's happening, particularly in Lincoln County, to help the Forest Service is um, the DNRC is currently working on a modification to our Good Neighbor Authority Agreement that will include more work to happen through the Good Neighbor Authority and um, just to ramp up that program to work particularly on those federal projects. The other thing that I know recently happened is uh, the Kootenai is the first for us to get direct infrastructure funds specifically to do work uh, in that landscape. And I think probably the main reason, one of the main reasons they got picked is because of all that other uh, local collaboration and the Good Neighbor Authority projects that we've been working on and that relationship that uh, DNRC has with the Forest Service. So I think those places that can show success will get more funding to help with the work on all lands, including the federal side. And, and that's fine. What I'm suggesting is, is before there's litigation, before you have to file all these briefs to support uh, a decision, is, is uh, try to get some understanding Yeah, I agree with you. And I, one of the things that we're trying to do with the Forest Action Plan is to, to do that, to, to do a better job of communicating the benefits of active management. I don't think we're there yet. Um, we probably need a couple more dedicated communications people on our staff to do that. Um, but that is also happening. Don't you think that even in Lincoln County, those groups are doing a little better job of explaining the benefits. So I, we, we do need to do more of it for sure. The problem is, is it takes dedicated staff to do it. Any other questions, comments? So I think it brings up the point that Mark talked about this morning that communications is such a huge 
problem uh, in terms of what needs to be done so that the public can take a ride. Yeah, I agree. Go ahead. I just think this stuff needs to be taught at a younger age. Yeah, you're right. We have a whole gap in generation here. problem. I was looking around the room 15, 20 years. This room is pretty empty. Yeah. They're teaching people this, and not only this, but the skills in order to take care of their own grandma. Yeah, I think you're right. We, we probably, in general, need to do a better job of teaching natural resources. I think in some cases that, I, I know there are some cases where there are teachers that are doing a really good job of that. And we do have some funds through forestry assistance where we help with some education initiatives, but I think we probably need to do more of it. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. That is a great question. Um, Eric or Seeley, I guess I'd, um, I, I'll throw out a number and then you can, you can help me out. I think a lot of it is in that $800 range. And if it's around homes, it's probably more like 1500 or it, it can be even higher. It, but it all depends, of course, right on the kind of treatment you're doing. If it's just prescribed fire and you're doing it over a large area, then it can be, you know, probably fifty dollars an acre, or maybe less. Um, but for mechanical treatment, yeah, I don't know, eight, eight hundred, something like that, a thousand. What do you think, Eric?